Today, we're here to discuss Wilbur and Orville Wright. Orville, in case you didn't know, is uh, the dapper one with the funny socks. This is on the back porch of their house at 7 Hawthorne Street in Dayton. We're here to talk about their rather clunky participation in the then brand new world of making and selling airplanes commercially. It's not that the Wrights weren't financially successful. Compare these two houses. If you visit Hawthorne Hill in Oakwood, you'll see a house that's about 6,000 square feet, much larger than 7 Hawthorne Street in West Dayton, which isn't there anymore, which is at Greenfield Village. If you see it there, it's around 1,200 square feet. It was a tight residence with limited privacy that was home to four adults when Wilbur and Orville were inventing and then trying to market the airplane. Tight enough that the Wrights started planning Hawthorne Hill, financed with the income they earned from their airplane, before Wilbur's death from typhoid fever in 1912. Orville, Catherine, and Milton moved into it in 1914, and anyone who built a house like Hawthorne Hill, after decades living in Seven Hawthorne, has found some sort of financial success. So, therefore, were the Wrights truly successful in business? Well, sort of. Orville was financially secure enough after selling the Wright Company in 1915 that he didn't have to hold a job for the remaining 33 years of his life. He owned his own vacation island, uh, Lambert Island, in Ontario's Georgian Bay off of Lake Huron. But also, no, not from a production adoption standpoint. The Wrights are justly famous for inventing the airplane, but their type of airplane was not purchased in significant numbers by militaries or private aviators and was a cul-de-sac in aviation history. As a sort of comparison, think of Henry Ford. Ford was a contemporary of the Wrights and an acquaintance of Orville uh, later in his life. Ford didn't invent the automobile, but Ford-branded vehicles are still on the road today, around the world, almost 80 years after his death. But the skies are filled with Boeing and Airbus, Bombardier or Embraer commercial airplanes, military aircraft from the likes of Lockheed Martin or Saab, and general aviation pipe aircraft from Piper or Cessna or Beechcraft, but not from Wright. There are no airplanes flying today that are connected to a company established by the brothers. Of modern airplane builders, only Boeing, established in 1916, was even around in the Wright era. So why aren't Wright airplanes in the skies today, flying amongst those other makes? It really comes down to the Wrights not being good corporate leaders and being able to make the transition from running a family business to being part of a corporation with other investors and managers. The sort of situation business historian Alfred Chandler addressed in 1977 and is still relevant Pulitzer Prize winning Visible Hand, the managerial revolution in American business. And it's not as though the Wrights didn't try to commercialize their work. They tried three times, forming companies in France, Germany, and the United States to produce and market their type of airplane. And they did so with some of the biggest names in business in those countries. Of course, the Wrights did have backgrounds in business, but business of a much smaller, more personal, and more local scope. Their two earlier enterprises were highly local and very small and operated much more informally than their airplane companies did. Wilbur and Orville's first business was in printing as write and write job printers. The brothers edited, printed, and published a few short-lived newspapers during their printing careers. The evening item uh, there is one of them. They also printed Paul Lawrence Dunbar's Tatler for its three-issue run in 1890. They were more successful in undertaking small projects for local clients, printing forms, tracts, or menu cards. Theirs was a small operation, nowhere near the size of Dayton's United Brethren Publishing House or Reynolds & Reynolds, two of the largest operations in town at the time, let alone the operations of the city's several daily newspapers. There was no right and right printing plant. Its equipment, all of it manually powered, fit within a few small rented rooms in its various locations. The brothers never incorporated right and right job printers. It had no stockholders. And Orville's friend, Ed Sines, was the only non-right it ever employed. The Wrights sold their printing business and left the field in 1899. But by then, printing was very much yesterday's news for the Wrights. They were part of the bicycling craze of the decade, both as writers and as businessmen, establishing what became the Wright Cycle Company in 1892. Like their printing business, the Wright Cycle Company was a small family operation with few employees. Charlie Taylor, who built the engine for the first airplane, was their one significant hire who wasn't immediate family. And the brothers only hired him in 1901 to give them more leeway to conduct their aeronautical experiments. 
The bike shop was also local in its customer base, and the brothers built few bicycles when compared with their competitors, while the Davis Sewing Machine Company, which is a great name for a bike company, to which today's Huffy bicycles trace their origin, reported selling 26,000 bicycles around the world in the two years before June of 1897, the Wrights built fewer than 200 bicycles of their own make over the course of seven years between 1897 and 1904, the most being 95 in 1898. Nor was the Wright Cycle Company incorporated or responsible to stockholders, as was Davis. With both Wright and Wright job printers and the Wright Cycle Company, Wilbur and Orville Wright were petit bourgeoisie businessmen. Their enterprises were family affairs. They were responsible only to themselves and could run their businesses as they saw fit, with no need to consider the opinions of others. They were their own managers. Nor did they have to deal with customers from outside Dayton. Government acquisition procedures, different cross-cultural expectations, postal speed, or communication in languages other than English. And in this era that we're talking about, of course, communication either went by post, which meant by ship, or by cable as expensive and thus short telegraph messages. So the Wrights experience in business before they tried to commercialize their airplane, personal involvement, independent personal decision-making with no fiduciary responsibilities to anyone but themselves. Their printing and bicycling experiences also differed in that there was little direct inventiveness coming from the brothers. They may have made tweaks to existing technologies, but they invented nothing of printing or bicycling significance and had no patents connected to either industry. Conversely, they well knew of the technological novelty of a viable airplane and realized soon after their 1903 flights that they needed to patent their invention if they were going to have any chance of capitalizing on it. After preparing and filing an application by themselves and having it rejected, they engaged Springfield patent attorney Harry Toulman in 1904 to manage the process, and the U.S. Patent Office granted the Wrights that patent in May of 1906. The Wrights also received equivalent patents in the U.K., France, Germany, and several other countries. With patent protection in hand, Wilbur and Orville decided that the time was right to capitalize on their invention. Now, the brothers didn't have much luck in marketing their airplane in 1906, a year when their airplane was the best available in the world. There were unsuccessful negotiations with the French Ministry of War Commission, and the Wrights sent letters to a number of other governments offering their airplane for sale. But governments were unsure of the military value of the open wood and fabric airplanes of the time, and there was no private market to supplement matters. And airplanes were expensive vehicles. Even once their airplanes were commercially available, they existed in a niche market and cost in the neighborhood of $5,000 or roughly $160,000 today. A 1909 Model T Ford cost around $900. Moreover, the Wrights didn't make it easy on potential buyers, principally governments, by insisting that there be a signed purchase contract before they, the Wrights, would allow the buyer to even see the airplane, let alone see it in flight. While the Wrights stated that they wouldn't require that a purchase would be completed if the airplane under contract didn't perform appropriately during demonstrations, their policy did not mesh very well with government procedure procurement policies predicated upon seeing products before purchasing them. However, in 1907, things began to change for the brothers. Ulysses Eddy, a New York businessman, read about the Wrights in the New York press. Intrigued, he visited them in Dayton and put them in touch with a sometime business partner of his, Charles Ramlett Flint, who has great sideburns. Flint was a successful international businessman, also based in New York, who was prominent for his roles in rubber and cotton companies and for his involvement in selling automobiles and submarines in Europe. Flint was interested in taking the brothers' invention to Europe and having all of them profit from the sale of the airplane to European governments. Flint through his occasional European agent Hart Berg, an American engineer originally from Philadelphia, who lived in Paris and Berlin and had an office in St. Petersburg, they had connections to continental levers of power that the brothers sorely lacked. And his involvement introduced the brothers to a different sort of business world than the one they'd experienced running printing and bicycling sales and repair shops in Dayton. And he had particular expectations for what this work would bring him. 
As the Wrights found out over the coming years, the men of business, and they were all men, who invested in their invention believed that they would be involved in running the companies in which they invested, and, of course, profit from their input. Berg, representing the brothers and Flint, pursued business arrangements in Europe while the Wrights handled their American affairs themselves. And soon, the brothers were part owners of three companies with the mission of building and selling Wright-type airplanes, the Compagnie Générale de Navigation Aérienne, yeah, maybe? It's the CGNA in France, Flugmaschine Wright in Germany, and the Wright Company in the United States. All three were independent of each other. Partial Wright ownership and the similarity of their products were the only threads linking them. The first of the three to be formed was the CGNA in Paris in November of 1908. Through Berg, the Wrights entered into an agreement with a consortium of prominent French businessmen, including Henri Deutsch de la Meurthe, who became wealthy from the oil industry, and Lazare Weiler, an inventor, businessman, industrialist, and politician originally from Alsace, also involved in telegraph and telephone wiring and in developing meters for taxi cabs. Deutsch had little involvement in running the company, but Weiler served as its first president. The CGNA was unique amongst the rights companies in how it operated. While the American and German companies had full responsibility for all aspects of production, from licensing to building to sales, the CGNA did not build airplanes. Instead, it licensed airplane production and sales to other companies. At the time of its establishment, it operated through four other French companies. It licensed Beriquand et Mar to build engines, Astra and Société des Ateliers et Chantiers to build airframes, and Ariel to actually sell the finished product. France was already on its way to becoming the center of global pre-Great War aviation, and the CGNA was not the first heavier-than-air aviation form formed there. Aviators Charles and Gabriel Voisin had formed Appareils d'Aviation Le Frère Voisin in 1906, demonstrating even before the Wrights ventured to France that they would never have its airplane market to themselves. Astra quickly became the sole builder of Wright-type airplanes in France, since Chantiers, located in distant Dunkirk, was too far from the CGNA's other Paris area licenses. The Wrights were usually even farther away, and their concomitant lack of managerial control of the CGNA soon soured their relationship with its board and with Astra. Owned by Deutsche de la Muerte, Astra is most remembered today for building lighter-than-air airships, but from 1909 to 1912, its workers in Biancourt, which is in red there, in central Paris here, the workers in Biancourt, which is also where Renault was headquartered too, they built wooden fabric airplanes for the Wright design from 1909 to 1912. It's unclear just how many Wright-type airplanes those workers built, as surviving records are selective and scanty, but there were at least several dozen that I can track. And building them, of course, was a slow process for laborers unfamiliar with the new technology and using metric tools while referencing models with imperial measured parts. It took nine months from the formation of the CGNA to the first finished airplanes leaving the Astra plant in the second half of 1909. And by 1910, those airplanes, pusher-style bipla biplanes with a propeller behind the pilot who sat exposed to the elements on a seat attached to the bottom wing, were finding few buyers. Though it was the principal potential customer, the French military refused to buy Astra's Wright-type airplanes, deciding not to purchase dual-propeller airplanes from any company in October of 1910 after a series of deadly accidents. Dual-propeller pusher models comprised the entire Wright lineup at the time, and the brothers were loath to shift to tractor-type models where the propeller is in front of the pilot. In particular, they thought that a propeller in front of the pilot interfered with the pilot's vision while conducting a scouting mission. French nationalism also affected the fortunes of the CGNA. In July of 1909, French aviator Louis Blériot made the first flight from Calais to Dover across the English Channel in a monoplane tractor airplane, claiming the thousand pound prize on offer from the London Daily Mail and becoming a sensation in a France where Wright airplanes 
would not be available at all until August. Still, respecting the right name at that point in time, the French military, who, which hadn't decided yet that it was going to not buy pusher planes, decided to purchase two Astrorite models in 1909, in addition to two Farman and one Blériot, but it was unimpressed with them. While the CGNA was officially a French company registered according to French law, half of its shares were owned by two Americans. At the beginning of a decade that reshaped Europe, the French government did not want to have a company that could potentially become a significant supplier of armaments to have significant foreign control. It wanted to be able to exert control over armament manufacturers in the event of war, and by 1911, the Aeronautique Militaire had decided that the CGNA was not a viable supplier. By any standard, Lazare Weiler, Henry Deutsch de la Muerte, and the other CGNA investors were good businessmen. Weiler and Deutsch, in particular, created companies with large numbers of employees that existed for many years and which earned them significant personal wealth. And they were worried about their investment. That worry started as soon as the end of 1910, when the CGNA asserted that a lack of cooperation from the rights was the cause of its business misfortunes. At a board meeting in December of 1910, the CGNA decided to formally transfer its commercial and industrial rights to Astra instead of having Astra license those rights. But aviation innovations made by other builders were changing the field, and Astra had little success with these newly acquired rights. The rights, with a W, maintained that their airplanes were the best there were and blamed poor management, bad bookkeeping, and faulty engines for their anemic market share in a market where Farman and Blériot models held nearly 70% of the sales between them. With such a dismal sales situation, the CGNA board decided that its best chance to ensure the firm's viability was to pursue patent royalty payments from other builders. With no other builders voluntarily making those payments, the CGNA decided to pursue them in court. The Wright's reputation as litigious inventors developed on both sides of the Atlantic. The CGNA needed to gain legal victory quickly if its stockholders were to profit from the royalties. The Wright's principal French patent was due to expire in 1917. So in 1910, it sued a bevy of French builders and aviators for infringement. As a result, the brothers' reputation in the French aviation community plummeted. No longer were they the cheered flyers of Le Mans or Poe of 1908 or 1909. Court filings required money, and the CGNA, with limited financial resources, pleaded with the rights, asking them to personally contribute to the firm's increasing legal costs. The brothers tersely responded that they would only advance funds to pursue infringement cases and not to keep the CGNA itself afloat. Eventually, they agreed to provide 5,000 francs, around $1,000 then, or around $32,000 today, as long as Astra and Lazare Weiler did so as well. And the CGNA's court filings paid off to a degree. In May of 1911, a French trial court indeed found that the Wright's invention was patentable and that the defendants had infringed upon it. However, some of the defendants appealed, and the judgment was stayed while the appeal was processed. The appeals process only reached court in May of 1914, and things that happened a few months later put a halt to any further legal action. Only in the 1920s did Orville finally receive royalty payments of some unknown amount. His financial records that Wright State has don't really have any good citations as to what, where his money's coming from then. And the CGNA itself, ceased to legally exist in 1922. The patents it owned had little effect on the development of French aviation during the war. Now, while the Wrights made occasional trips to Europe, most of their contact with the CGNA and with Flugmaschine Wright in Berlin came from their home in Dayton, and most of it was via letter. While the brothers had a telephone connection in their bicycle shop as early as 1902, Transatlantic telephone service did not exist until 1926, and the high cost of the transatlantic telegraph made it impractical for all but the shortest, most urgent messages. Letters to the Wrights from Paris or Berlin took at least a week to reach their destination, as did any reply, crossing the Atlantic via steamship. And letters from the CGNA were almost always written in French, 
a language which neither Wilbur nor Orville had fluency. It's unclear how the Wrights were able to understand the letters. Their, their the replies show clear comprehension. Perhaps they slowly read each letter with a dictionary at hand. Uh, perhaps their younger sister, Catherine, who taught Latin at Dayton Steele High School until Orville's accident at Fort Myer in 1908, had enough romance language skill to translate. Perhaps they found someone else to put the correspondence into English. Regardless of how they obtained them, the brothers were reliant on those translations in comprehending the ongoing business of the CGNA. Letters sent to Paris were written in English, of course, and required translation upon reaching France. Distance, time, and language were all barriers to Wilbur's and Orville's desire to have a maximum level of control over the firm in charge of their French business affairs and their German business affairs. And even though their maternal grandfather was the, from the Saxony-Thuringia borderlands in today's Eastern Germany, Wilbur and Orville were just as fluent in German as they were in French, which is to say they weren't. Established in May of 1909, Flug Machine Wright's structure resembled that of the American Wright Company more than that of the CGNA, in that it built its own airplanes, with rights to the German, Ottoman, Swedish, Danish, Norwegian, and Luxembourgish markets. Interesting, not, not Austria-Hungary. Its investors included industrialist and arms maker Isidore Lowe, Walter Rathenau, a leader of the Allgemeine Elektrizitätsgesellschaft, who as German foreign minister for the Weimar Republic was assassinated in 1922, and airship pioneer, balloonist, and entrepreneur Richard von Kehler, who was the brother's principal contact for the business. But even with such august investors, things turned out poorly for the rights in Germany, a country where the court system ruled against the right patent, deciding that its principal claims were invalid due to prior disclosure and where Ferdinand von Zeppelin's rigid airships took much of the country's aviation-related attention and funding. But before the court rulings, Flug Machine Wright got off to a decent start. Headquartered in Berlin, the company's workers began building airplanes in Reinickendorf, near where Berlin's Tegel Airport later stood in the northwest of the city, and in 1910 moved its operations south to Johannesthal, not far from today's Berlin-Brandenburg Airport. Their products followed the basic design used in France and the United States, a two-seat pusher wood and fabric airplane. Over the course of 1910 and 1911, Flug Machine Wright sold several dozen of its airplanes to Germans and to people in other countries. Instructions on how to fly the airplane was included in the purchase price of more than 20,000 marks, as it was for purchasers in France and the US. German aviation historian Werner Schwipps stated that Flug Machine Wright was so busy in its 1909-1910 fiscal year that it used the services of a boatyard in Hamburg as a subcontractor to keep up with orders, though no production numbers are extant. Business fortunes started to slip for Flug Machine Wright in 1911. Though German military officials and Prince Heinrich, Kaiser Wilhelm II's brother, had visited the Johannesthal factory, and many, including the Kaiser, had watched Orville conduct exhibition flights in 1909, and though Flug Machine Wright pilots participated in several organized events open to German flying airplanes of all makes, the German military opted to principally acquire Farman type airplanes built in Germany by Albatross. It and Aviatik, two completely German owned companies, were seen as forward looking producers by the German general staff. Flug Machine Wright was not. And in 1912, the company sold only two aircraft. On a personal level, Paul Engelhardt, who was friendly with the brothers and Flug Machine Wright's chief pilot and technical director, died in a crash in 1911, September of 1911. An attempt by the board to increase the firm's operating capital raised only 200,000 of the 400,000 marks desired, or about $50,000 of $100,000 in 1912-ish dollars. At the end of 1912, the number of Flug Machine Wright employees could be counted on one hand. The company, though, said that protecting the Wright patent provided it a reason to stay in business. Wilbur and Orville Wright are famous for their litigiousness in defense of their patent rights, and they were as litigious in France and Germany as they would be in the United States. However, they found that interpretation of patent law is not internationally uniform, even if the patent under litigation is essentially the same in each particular country. The Wrights transferred their rights to their patents to each of their companies upon its creation. 
French courts upheld the CGNA's patent rights, both at the trial level and on appeal. Though the CGNA gained little from the case as the company was already irrelevant in French aviation, when the appellate court decided in its favor mere months before the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo, and that which left the enforcement to an unknown future. Courts in the United States also generally ruled in favor of the rights in the right company, but the right company in the US spent more effort in its litigation than in its technological development, and appeals and countersuits resulted in the US government insisting on an end to the battle in 1917 when it entered the First World War and commanded the establishment of a patent pool to stop the litigation and allow technological development in aviation to take place more easily. German courts, though, ruled differently. In Germany, Flugmaschine Wright was the defendant, not the plaintiff. A group of German aviators, some with their own patents, sued it. They found success with the trial court, which declared that the publication of the main details of the patent in two non-German periodicals, the English Automotor Journal in 1902 and the French Le Aeronaut in 1903, amounted to prior disclosure and therefore invalidated the most important claim in the German patent. On appeal, and Orville himself ventured to Berlin with Catherine for the case's hearing in 1913, Flugmaschine Wright fared slightly better, but the appellate verdict had little effect since its points favorable to Flugmaschine Wright concerned technical connections that even Flugmaschine Wright airplanes no longer employed. And that was the death knell for the company. In the fall of 1914, after the start of the war, Richard von Kehler informed the German business world that the firm had gone into liquidation. Neither Orville nor any of the German investors would gain any further benefit from his and his brother's invention. Unlike with the case of the CGNA, he does not seem to have received any post-war royalty payments from Germany, though given the state of post-war Germany, expectations of such payments were probably unwarranted. The brothers' most successful commercial airplane venture the Wright Company was their U.S. operation. The 1909 acceptance flights flown by Orville at Fort Myer in Virginia as part of the Signal Corps' purchase of the first U.S. military airplane created interest among some prominent businessmen in commercially selling Wright airplanes domestically. And as in France and Germany, those men were quite prominent in the business world. Andrew Friedman had owned the New York Giants baseball team and was the director of the Interboro Rapid Transit Company one of the earliest subway operators in the city. August Belmont was also involved with the IRT and built the Belmont Park horse track. The famous horse race is named for his father. Cornelius Vanderbilt came from the third nationally prominent generation of his family and was yet another IRT investor, among other things, while Russell Alger, the only director besides the Wrights based outside of New York, was a Packard executive in Detroit whose father was a prominent Michigan politician. There were several other famous and wealthy investors. As with the CGNA and Flugmaschine Wright, the board members were the company's stockholders. The Wright Company incorporated in New York in November of 1909 with Wilbur as its president and Orville and Andrew Friedman as its two vice presidents. For most of its period under Wright involvement, the Wright Company maintained its headquarters in Manhattan in an office run by Alpheus Barnes, the company's secretary and treasurer, while the factory was in Dayton first in rented space made available by the Speedwell Motor Car Company in the Edgemont neighborhood of Dayton, and in 1910 in the first purpose-built airplane factory building in the United States off West 3rd Street, midway between the brothers' home on Hawthorne Street and the central branch of the National Home for Disabled Volunteer Soldiers, which is the uh, one that burned about this time last year. Initially, the Wright Company had some success. The distances between the headquarters office where Barnes ran the day-to-day -day affairs of the business, the Dayton factory, and the rights themselves in their old bicycle shop on West 3rd Street were obstacles the company never overcame, and were obstacles enhanced by Wilbur and Orville's inability to personally get along with the New York-based directors or with Barnes. Aviation, of course, was a new industry, and the rights believed that as the inventors of the industry, they knew best how to develop it. However, most of their investors were prominent capitalists connected to other forms of transportation. And though none of them had invested their entire fortunes in the venture of the Wright Company, they were men with their own ideas on how a profitable business should operate and expectations that their opinions mattered. The Wright Company was not the family business that the Wright Cycle Company was, 
And Wilbur and Orville found that they could not operate as unilaterally as they had as, as printers or as bicycle makers. Wilbur and Orville never had the ability to provide much on-site guidance to the CGNA or to Flug Machine Wright. Their visits were rare and usually coincided with scheduled board meetings. There is little evidence of them ever showing up on the production floor. But the Wright Company's factory was just a quick hop on the city railway streetcar from the brothers' West Third Street bicycle shop where they kept their personal office. And while the Wright Company initially tried to implement the beginnings of a managerial structure with Frank Russell, Russell Alger's nephew, as the factory's general manager, and later employing Grover Loning in a similar role, that structure failed. Wilbur and Orville, or just Orville for Loning, were resented by Russell and Loning for being micromanagers. The brothers refused to entertain Russell's ideas on how to run the business. Orville had little interest in the ideas of Loning, who was the first person in the United States to get an academic degree in aeronautical engineering from Columbia University. And by the time Loning was working for the Wright Company, 1913 to 1914, it sorely needed someone with an aeronautical engineering background. But as in France and Germany, patent lawsuits took up significant amounts of corporate energy and money, while the Wright Company's competitors, especially upstate New York aviator Glenn Curtis, worked to develop airplanes that might escape the strictures of the Wright's 1906 patent, which the Wright Company owned. The zenith of the Wright Company came between 1910 and 1912, the years in which factory workers, and there weren't that many of them, perhaps 40, principally built the Model B. Building an airplane in this era involved workers with significant carpentry skills. There was no assembly line, and individual airplanes moved between stations in the factory during construction. But even as aviation changed, the Wright Company did not try to develop new technologies. The brothers feared that doing so would signal to their competitors that their patent had been surpassed and was irrelevant. Therefore, the Wright Company changed its airplanes very little during the years the brothers were officers. In 1915, the Royal Aeronautical Society's flight magazine noted that the then new Model HS was, quote, still the Wright biplane of old. But the greater aviation world was changing. As in France, pusher-style airplanes lost out to tractor airplanes. In particular, the Wright Company's Model C, a pusher, had issues with power and controls, issues that Orville denied existed. And these issues led to the deaths of several U.S. Army aviators and the Army subsequently condemning all the pusher airplanes the military had at that point. As was the case in Europe, the military was the largest potential customer for the Wright Company, and Orville continued to maintain that pusher-style airplanes were superior to tractors, even after the condemnation. And since the Wright Company pointedly built nothing but pushers after 1913, its greater potential customer was no longer interested in its products. So a major potential source of income was closed unless the company changed the product line. Exhibition aviation also brought the Wright Company significant income in 1910 and 1911. Airplanes were rare things then. Few people had seen one in operation. So most early aviation companies sponsored exhibition units and the Wright Company was no different with its exhibition department. Coordinated by aviator Roy Nabenshoe, the company's exhibition department aviators flew at fairs and other public events across North America, wowing crowds with the new technology, always trying to fly higher or faster. But flying open wooden cloth aircraft from a seat on the wing with no seat belt or supplemental oxygen when at altitude was anything but safe, and the deaths of several of the Wright Company's pilots during exhibitions caused the brothers to insist that the company close its exhibition department at the end of the 1911 season. The exhibition department had been one of the company's best revenue generators through the appearance fees it charged, and it also served as a customer of sorts for the airplanes that came out of the factory. With its closure, which was soon followed by the military's condemnation of pushers, the Wright Company was not in a good financial place after 1912, and the members of the board protested that they were losing money. That was also the year in which Wilbur Wright died from typhoid fever in May. His death elevated Orville, who was one of the two vice presidents, along with Andrew Friedman, to the company's presidency. Orville was not interested in incorporating the methods of others into Wright Company operations, but he also recognized that he did not have the interest or the skills to effectively run a corporation. He also suffered from severe pain from the injuries he sustained at Fort Myer in 1908. 
And with the constant court battles over the patent wearing on him, Orville decided in 1914 that he wanted out. Courts ruled in favor of the right company on the patent, but other aviators, and Glenn Curtis especially, pursued workarounds, such as Curtis's less than ethical rebuilding and flight of Samuel Langley's aerodrome that kept the enforcement of the court decisions in abeyance. Over the course of 1914, Orville personally bought out all of the other Wright Company stockholders, save publisher Robert Collier, with whom Orville was more friendly than the other directors, gaining personal control of the company. Simultaneously, he entertained purchase offers for the company. It may not have been building airplanes that anyone flew, but the patent still had several years of viability, if royalties could be collected, and the Wright name also had value. In the fall of 1915, he sold the Wright Company to a group of investors based in New York for half a million dollars, the equivalent of around $15 million today. The new owners moved the Wright Company to New Jersey in 1916, and its legacy lives on today as part of the Curtis Wright Corporation, which is one of the most ironic mergers to have ever taken place in 1929, given that Glenn Curtis and the Wright brothers basically hated each other. Curtis Wright workers built propeller-driven airplanes into the Second World War. The company did not transition to building jets, and today instead makes a variety of airplane components and other highly technical parts. By the time Orville received whatever royalties he did when the CGNA formally dissolved in 1922, he was comfortably ensconced in Hawthorne Hill. He invested well and had no financial worries for the rest of his life, and when he died in 1948, he left an estate valued at more than a million dollars, roughly 12.2 million today. But his airplane businesses, rather forgotten memories in France and Germany, are subsumed into a larger corporation where the right name on its letterhead was the extent of his legacy. The CGNA, Flug Machine Wright, and the Wright Company all contributed to Orville spending the last 35 years of his life as an elder statesman, perhaps the elder statesman of aviation, serving on boards such as that of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NASA's predecessor, and receiving honorary degrees from nearly a dozen colleges and universities while tinkering in his laboratory on North Broadway Street in West Dayton. He made no significant further contributions to the development of aviation. But had he and Wilbur been more capable of bridging the divide between operating family-run small businesses and running corporations, the right name might be involved in arrivals and departures at airports throughout the world today. Though, as this 2018 comic suggests, that might not have meant much.